We're going to move on now, as Nisha said, and talk about the issues of valve prostheses. And let's get to Dr. Geske's questions. So question number one is a 38-year-old man undergoing aortic valve replacement for bicuspid aortic stenosis with a St. Jude bileaflet mechanical prosthesis. His EF is 60. He's got no history of arrhythmias. What antithrombotic regimen is recommended for him? Warfarin to an INR of 2.5. The same warfarin plus aspirin 81. Warfarin to an INR of 1.5 to 2. Or a pixaban dosed appropriately for his renal function. Okay. Question number two. A 55-year-old man with a Medtronic Hall mitral prosthesis has a, has a stroke. Her INR at the time of the stroke was 2.8. Her antithrombotic regimen is warfarin with a goal INR of 3 and aspirin 81. What should we recommend now that she's had the stroke? Increase the aspirin to 325, no change in warfarin. Add clopidogrel. Increase the target INR to 3.5. Increase the target INR to 4 or change the warfarin to dubigatran. Question number three. An 83-year-old man presents five years after mitral bioprosthetic implantation. He's got New York Heart Association class two dyspnea, Mean gradient is 11 at a heart rate of 64. What is the most appropriate initial treatment? Is it going to be emergency surgery, emergency thrombolytic, eptifibotide, or warfarin? All right. Hmm. And question number four, a 78-year-old woman presents for annual physical three years post-surgical AVR. She's doing well. A short ejection murmur is heard on exam over the aortic area. No cardiac imaging has been performed since shortly after surgery. What is the most appropriate recommendation? Order a transthoracic echo to determine her prosthesis gradient. Repeat her exam in three months. Do the transthoracic echo in one year at a return visit, or no cardiac imaging is recommended for this individual? We have competing options. All right, so Dr. Geske, working in the valve clinic uh, and our course one of our co-planners here is going to talk to you about prosthetic valves. Again, this is super important. When to follow up, antithrombotic regimens, always are going to be tested on the board examination. So Jeff, tell us what we need to know. Well, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back to talk about prosthetic valves. And I have no disclosures, although again, the sense of humor disclosure remains from as it did with prior talks. I remember pretty vividly when Dr. Nishimura approached me to give this talk. He came up to me and he said, Jeff, uh, we'd really like you to give a talk at the board review where you describe the types of prosthetic valves and compare their relative benefits and risks to explain why you might choose one versus the other. And I said, yeah, I think I could do that. And then came the day when the learning objectives were distributed and I realized maybe this was more than I thought it was gonna be. But we're going to distill all those learning objectives down, and we're going to talk about all of prosthetic valves in a nutshell. And in order to do that, we'll really be looking at the 2020 valve guidelines with also some, some information from the 2017 update. But when you look at the references that are here, they have something in common. And especially after uh, our last lecturer just gave these two masterful lectures on valve disease and as part of these valve guidelines, you know, there's a little bit of pressure giving a lecture like this 
to do a good job. So hopefully we still cover things accurately. In order to do that, we're gonna first look at types of prostheses and we'll discuss mechanical versus prosthetic, bioprosthetic. We'll then talk about which valve do you choose for which patient. And we will specifically address surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcatheter aortic valve implantation. We'll then move on to management of prostheses. We'll talk about antithrombotics, follow-up timing and when to do imaging, dental cares, and perioperative considerations. We'll conclude with a laundry list of complications spanning from structural failure all the way to patient prosthesis mismatch. So let's start off with types of prosthesis and just broadly bucketing things. A prosthesis can either be mechanical or bioprosthetic. If we look at the mechanical ones, there's these old ball cage valves, and we don't implant these anymore, but they're quite durable. So it may still be that you encounter a patient that has one of these ball cage valves. There are tilting disc valves, as shown here. The most modern of these being the Medtronic Hall valve, which has a central post that this valve leaflet pivots upon. And that'll come into play a little bit later when we're discussing what normal looks like, that this valve has a central post. But almost all mechanical prostheses that are implanted nowadays are bi-leaflet valves, with the St. Jude being the most commonly implanted, but the on-X valve, shown in the upper corner here, also having some very special considerations that we'll talk about a little bit later. Mechanical prostheses can be attached to a tubular graft that helps to replace not only the valve, but the ascending aorta. So here are some examples of valved conduits. Now, we said that there can be mechanical prostheses, but there can also be tissue prostheses. Let's look at different types of tissue prostheses. Many of these are xenografts, meaning they come from animal origin, whether it's porcine, bovine, equine, and they could be, uh, they could be a pericardial nature, they could be an explanted jugular venous valve, but there's a lot of different flavors of xenografts. These can be stented valves, as shown here, or stentless valves, and just like mechanical prostheses, they can be attached to a tubular graft and therefore form a conduit. Autographs, really the one that we talk about in this scenario is the Ross procedure, wherein the native aortic uh, uh, valve is explanted and the patient's pulmonary valve is transposed into the aortic position. Homographs refer to cadaveric grafts that, are com that come from humans and these can be used either, either as a valve alone or as a valved conduit. Transcatheter prostheses fall under the umbrella of bioprostheses. Here shown are the Edward Sapien valve and the Medtronic core valve. And I used to, as I would describe these valves, I would say they're kind of like the new kids on the block. But really these have been around long enough to realize that the new kids on the block are getting kind of old. So I don't know that I would describe them as the new kids on the block anymore. But know that these are here to stay and continue to shape the landscape of prostheses. So when determining which of those valves to put in for which patient, we need to ask ourselves one very important question. And that question is, which is the lesser of the evils? There is a trade-off between durability and antithrombotic need when choosing between mechanical prostheses and bioprostheses. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit more. And know that this transcatheter revolution has really changed a lot of which valve for which patient there has been an enormous shift in our clinical decision-making. I might even describe it as this. You know, a paradigm shift. So with this paradigm shift, we've seen that different patients may now be getting bioprostheses that previously we would have thought about mechanical prostheses. Partner three taught us that we can implant these in patients with low operative risk because we see that there is low risk of composite death, stroke, and rehospitalization with TAVI compared to SAVR. So who cares? What do you mean? Why is this a paradigm shift? Well, previously, mechanical prostheses would be used if we thought that a patient might require future reoperation on the valve, but now there's this possibility of valve-in-valve -valve implantation that doesn't require a sternotomy. 
But there's still some unanswered questions and some requirements. You need a big enough hole to put in the new valve. There's a little bit of nesting Russian doll phenomena whereby you can put something inside of something, inside of something, inside of something. Eventually, you run out of space. And the durability of valve within valve is not that well studied. So how do the 2020 guidelines direct us? There's some age-based criteria as to who should receive surgical AVR versus TAVI. They say that SAVR is preferred if the age is less than 65 and the life expectancy is greater than 20. TAVI, on the other hand, is preferred if age is greater than 80 and life expectancy is less than 10. And if you're in that middle ground of 65 to 80, that shared decision making is key. SAVR should be preferred if transfemoral access is not possible. Whereas SAVR also should be considered if you are approaching an asymptomatic patient with very severe disease or rapid progression, some of these class 2A recommendations, because those weren't really what was studied in the TAVI trials. And TAVI is preferred if the patient is inoperable, if SAVR is not an option, but the life expectancy is greater than one year. How about mechanical versus tissue? Who should get each of those? Mechanical valves should be considered in patients under the age of 50 undergoing AVR or under the age of 65 undergoing MVR. And you should also consider mechanical valves if the patient already has a need for antithrombotic therapy because they're already going to be anticoagulated anyway, so that downside ends up being not much of an evil. There's a new kind of asterisk on this slide in that the 2020 guidelines talk about the Ross procedure being a class 2B, wherein in young patients you could consider transposing that native pulmonary valve into the aortic position. Now, I would caution you, in my mind, many times Ross is a four-letter word meaning I'm not real thrilled about use of the Ross procedure because you can take a one-valve issue and turn it into a two-valve issue. But there have been some, uh, some analyses at very experienced centers looking at Ross procedure to suggest that this may be appropriate in very select instances. Biologic valves should be utilized in older patients or in those patients with contraindications to anticoagulation. And we should emphasize shared decision-making for all as we're choosing the correct prosthesis. This can get really complicated, right? Those last few slides had a lot of if this, then this. And here's a nice flow chart that kind of puts it all together. This was crafted with Dr. Nishimura, and I think this is a great way if you're approaching a patient with AVR just to kind of put together the concepts that we just discussed. Now, in a special scenario where the patient has aortic valve disease that requires aortic valve replacement, and they also have an aortopathy involving the sinus of Valsalva, you need to give your surgeon a call, and you need to alert them of both of these issues going on together. And they may, they may tell you, wow, both of those going on together, I'm not sure I can do it. And you say, you can do it. You can do it. And you might even say, you conduit, okay? Because when you involve the sinus of Valsalva, that's when you really need to use one of these conduit grafts. You can't do a root-sparing procedure. The downside of using a conduit is that you have to re-implant the coronary arteries, so that adds some complexity. But if the sinus of Valsalva is involved, just remember, you conduit. Mitraclip, or T-E-E-R, as Dr. Nishimura referred to it, can be used in inoperable patients with native mitral uh, regurgitation. Notice this is not truly a prosthesis, but I do think it's worth mentioning here. Transcatheter options can be used in the mitral position. The mitral trial, M-I-T-R-A-L, studied valve in MAC, and what we learned from that is that this is feasible, but there's very high mortality and morbidity associated with it. Similarly, valve in ring or valve in valve, transmitral valve implantation is evolving. All right, well, we've talked about types of prostheses. Let's move on to management now, starting with antithrombotics. And there has been huge changes in this discussion in lieu of the 2020 guidelines. So the 2017 guidelines, they said aspirin for everyone. You have a prosthesis, you should be on aspirin. Not so much in the 2020 guidelines. The 2020 guidelines say that there's been a shift in how we think of this. That 
for a tissue prosthesis, we should still use aspirin. But for a mechanical prosthesis, for a mechanical prosthesis, an individualized approach that takes the risk of bleeding into account is required. And notice I put that in direct quotes, and it's a class 2B. So how you deal with aspirin in a patient that is on therapeutic anticoagulation for a mechanical prosthesis requires some individualized choice. It's not the default anymore. When we use warfarin for a mechanical prosthesis, we are trying to balance the benefits of decreasing thrombosis with the risks of bleeding. And this is a rather old trial, 1995, but I think it illustrates the point nicely that we're trying to find this point where ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke cross one another. And you'll notice in this older trial using older valves that the goal is higher, but I think the principle still holds true even with more modern prostheses, that we're trying to balance those two risks. And not all valves are created equal with regards to those risks. Both the implantation location and the type of prosthesis matter. So for an aortic prosthesis, those are at lower risk than a mitral prosthesis, which are at lower risk than having both mitral and aortic prostheses. And using a modern bileaflet valve is at lower risk than a tilting disc or a caged ball. So this comes into play as we assign what our goal INR is for these prostheses. What about direct oral anticoagulants? Should we use those in mechanical valves? What is the data? Well, this is the study here. This is the realign study that looked at dabigatran for patients with mechanical valves. And what we learned is that this is not good. These patients did poorly. The trial had to be stopped early. And so if you're thinking about a DOAC in a patient with a mechanical valve, that is a Mona Lisa frown. Do not do that, okay? With one little caveat is that there's an ongoing trial right now called PROACT that's looking at apixaban in a very specific instance of the on-X bileaflet prosthesis implanted in the aortic position. This is an ongoing trial. I would not recommend use of DOAC for any mechanical prosthesis at any time with current data. How about bioprostheses? Is it okay to use all these DOACs with bioprostheses? The 2017 and, 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 and prior guidelines did not specify, but there's been a shift in this. Now the guidelines tell us that as long as you're three months out, it is okay to use a DOAC in those scenarios. So if you have a, a mitral valve repair with some prosthetic material, if you have a bioprosthesis, it is okay after you go beyond the three-month implant time frame. And that three-month implant time frame comes from Galileo data that suggests that we should perhaps not use DOACs in that initial window. So this is a Mona Lisa smile, okay? The differences here is that DOACs are okay in bioprostheses after three months, not okay in mechanical prostheses. So why do we use different INR goals for different positions? Why, why does that make sense? Well, we think that there's conservation of flow. The amount of flow that goes into the heart is the amount of flow that comes out of the heart. But the speeds that things go across the valves differ, and that relates to the fact that the size of the hole differs. The AV valves, mitral and tricuspid valves, are larger in circumference. They're bigger holes. Therefore, the speed of blood, the velocity of blood going across them is slower. And know that slower flow, stasis, is actually part of what causes thrombosis. When you have a big metal valve with slow flow going across it, it's more thrombotic. So we can put this into a graphic schema to understand the modernness of the prosthesis and the position to understand our anticoagulation goals and our thrombosis risk. So here we go as we go from aortic to mitral to tricuspid, our risk of thrombosis goes up. And similarly, as we get older with regards to our prostheses, our thrombosis risk goes up. And if we're in that corner of an aortic prosthesis with a modern bileaflet valve, then we have this very specific time when we can have a lower INR goal, as long as there's not additional risk factors. So your next question is, well, what risk factors? Well, I'm glad you asked, because here they are. Atrial fibrillation, previous thromboembolism, hypercoagulable condition, or a reduced EF less than 30%. If these are present, then you may have a higher INR goal, not that lower INR goal. So let's 
think about it again in a different format. If the stars align, you have an aortic position graft. You have a bileaflet or a medtronic hall, so a more modern prosthesis. And you have none of those four risk factors, then the stars are aligned and your INR goal is 2.5. Now there can be actually a super alignment. And the super alignment is when you have an aortic position with that on X prosthesis and no risk factors. And actually those patients can have an even lower INR goal of 1.5 to 2. It's a very non-thrombotic prosthesis and allows us to have a lower INR goal. And I've definitely had patients that desire this prosthesis because of this effect. If the stars do not align, if the stars do not align, then you have a higher INR goal. So non-aortic position or an older prosthesis or risk factors, then your INR goal should be three. If you're in that first three months after you implant a bioprosthesis, then you should be on warfarin with an INR goal of 2.5. If it's a transcatheter valve, then there's still, the jury's still out a little bit whether this should be dual antiplatelet therapy versus warfarin therapy. And I would uh, say that that's not entirely clear which one of those is the best approach. Beyond three months, no risk factors, you should be on aspirin. If you do have risk factors, then I think this desires, this results in very individualized care because you might have the patient just on therapeutic anticoagulation. There might be times when they need aspirin and therapeutic anticoagulation. And again, I think that I have them both listed here, but I would say to individualize that discussion there. It might be that you just switch them from aspirin to therapeutic anticoagulation. What do we do when embolic events occur? How do we adjust antithrombotic therapy? Well, if, they're on, if they have a tissue valve in, they should be on aspirin. If they're not, then you should correct that. If they're already on aspirin, then you should change that to vitamin K antagonist warfarin. If you have a mechanical valve and you, with an INR goal of 2.5 and they have an embolic event, then you're going to either increase the INR to 3.0 or add aspirin. If they were already on aspirin, then you definitely go up on your INR goal. If your INR goal was 3.0, then you're gonna jump all the way up to an INR goal of 4.0. And that might make you nervous at first, but actually remember that 1995 trial where the, where the lines crossed was actually farther out near this INR 4.0 goal. So if you have a patient with an INR goal of three who's already on aspirin and then has an embolic event, your new INR goal becomes 4.0. What should we do at our first uh, post-op visit when this valve has just been implanted? You need to take a history and get a really good exam. You are doing an auscultory fingerprinting of the valve. You're gonna get some basic tests to understand where the patient is following the implant. And then you're going to fingerprint the valve with echocardiography. And this is to be done within that first time frame uh, after the implant. So within six, we six weeks to three months, if it has not been done while the patient is hospitalized. Correlate your exam and your echocardiogram. Again, what you're doing is you're setting a benchmark to compare back against as you follow that patient. The next five slides include just a few little things that I would think about for each of the different prostheses. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. They're mostly there for your reference. For ball cage, you can have multiple clicks. You could hear a rattle. It's abnormal if you hear a regurgitant murmur or if those clicks go away. The ball can be really hard to see and you might just see flow around a central obstacle. That doesn't mean that there is a problem. You should see a closing volume and usually very little regurgitation. For tilting disc valves, this may have a soft or inaudible click. They can have an uh, opening click. They can have a prominent closing click though. They may be associated with a flow murmur. They have a single disc and therefore it results in asymmetric opening, one large and one small orifice. And if you have a Medtronic Hall valve, know that there's that central post. And because of that, you can see a prominent central regurgitation jet that is normal. Bileaflet valves have a prominent closing click, can be associated with a flow murmur. And you'll see two discs resulting in therefore three openings, two larger and one smaller central valve. These can have a small amount of regurgitation that's actually designed as part of the valve to wash the valve and keep it clean. Bioprostheses, 
The closing should be inaudible many times. They may or may not have a flow murmur. And aortic homographs in particular are really hard to distinguish between native grafts. These valves should not leak. And a typical appearance may have stents as part of it, these struts that you can see if it is a stented bioprosthesis. Transcatheter valves may have uh, no sounds associated with them or may have a flow murmur. And know that evaluation can sometimes be challenging as far as seeing the leaflets, but pay careful attention to presence of periprosthetic regurgitation. There are certain auscultory posts that we want to use, and I've listed normal findings for prostheses at those posts in this slide for your review. When should you re-image a prosthesis? Well, you should be seeing those patients back annually with physical examinations. And if there's a change in clinical status or a change in your exam compared to your benchmark that you did immediately post-implant, that's when you should send them to ECHO. If not, as far as surveillance echo goes, there's been a slight change in the 2020 guidelines. They now say that we can look at the valve again at five years and at 10 years. But TAVI, we should still do annually. We're still trying to figure out a lot more about these valves. So TAVI, we do annually, surgically implanted bioprostheses every five and then 10 years. Notice that there is no role for routine echocardiogram when a patient presents with similar exam findings, no symptoms. Don't just get the echo. Don't overtest. Be a great exam question for the boards. Dental cleanings are important. We've learned about this from Dr. Cullen. So don't forget dental history. Anyone with a prosthesis, you should gather a dental history. These patients should be undergoing dental cleanings twice per year. They should receive dental prophylactic antibiotics for anyone with a prosthesis, anyone with prosthetic material in their heart. And we've learned about this importance even in transcatheter valves or valve repairs from Dr. Cullen, okay? So make sure that you are seeing your dentist. Don't forget the dental history in patients with prostheses. Paraprocedural anticoagulation and mechanical prostheses. Most patients only have a slight risk off of anticoagulation, and all patients do not need to necessarily have heparin bridging. Continue warfarin in minor procedures with easily controlled bleeding. So the first thing you ask yourself is, do we really have to stop the warfarin? If not, then proceed. If you do need to stop the warfarin, then you have a series of questions that you want to ask yourself. What is the risk of the valve? Are there any additional risk factors? And what is the bleeding risk of the procedure? Now, these first two boxes we've seen already. What's the risk of the valve and what are the risk factors? We talked about that already. So what we really need to ask then is what is the bleeding risk? So high bleeding risk procedures are listed here. And in particular, I draw your attention to neuraxial anesthesia. There's not a lot of real estate when you're dealing with that. And so you need to watch out for, those, for that bleeding. When should we bridge? If you're in the aortic position and you have either a bi-leaflet or a Medtronic Hall position with no risk factors, then no bridging. Just go ahead and stop the anticoagulation. Everything else, bridge. It's whether the stars align or not. So how about bioprostheses? No risk factors, no bridging. If it's in those first three months or you have risk factors, then you have to look at those risk factors and decide because those patients may warrant bridging. A practical approach, how do you actually do that? So if the stars align, I would hold warfarin for five days preoperatively. I'd obtain an INR on the morning of the procedure, and then I'd restart warfarin post-procedure. That's it. For everything else, I'd stop warfarin five days uh, prior to the procedure. I'd begin low molecular weight heparin bridging when the INR falls below two, usually about three days pre-procedure, with the last dose 24 hours prior to surgery. I'd then check an INR in the morning of the procedure, restart warfarin immediately postoperatively, remember DVT prophylaxis, and don't be too eager to restart the heparin because you can result in postoperative bleeding complications. If you have to reverse, use low-dose vitamin K or FFP in emergencies. Don't give low molecular weight heparin in patients who have renal failure. Don't use large-dose vitamin K because you don't want to end up with excess bruising or bleeding in these patients, okay? So know that bridging is important, just like we learned about from Dr. Cullen's preoperative lecture. 
We've talked about management of prostheses. Let's move on to the final portion of the talk, complications. And the most common complication in bioprostheses ends up being degenerative calcification. You can see an example here where degenerative calcium has built up in the bellies of these cusps. And this can also be a problem with fibrous ingrowth. We can get fibrous panis ingrowth that can result in structural failure. Not quite as common as calcification, but one of the structural failures. You can actually break the valve, a flail leaflet, or in those older ball cage valves, you can actually embolize the ball. So I guess this went from a ball cage valve to just a cage valve here. So know that these are some of the potential structural complications. But it's not always the fault of the prosthesis itself. You have to pay attention to the neighborhood. And what do I mean by pay attention to the neighborhood? Well, look at the structures or anatomy around the prosthesis. So here is a TAVI that is placed too low. The leaflets may be working fine, but you'd have to watch out for uh, obstruction in the mitral inflow as well as for periprosthetic regurgitation. Here's a conduit that was squished externally by a mediastinal tumor. And here's a mechanical prosthesis placed in the mitral position, and leaflet motion looks great. It's just too bad that this one is sitting in the outflow tract, so the aortic valve barely opens now. So just know that in a bad neighborhood, sometimes complications can occur. What about perivalvular leak? Poor outcome, particularly with regards to transcatheter prostheses. This could be its own talk, how you quantify this, how you look for it. But just know if you have someone who's undergone TAV that you should be looking for periprosthetic regurgitation. And in patients with conduits, you don't have periprosthetic regurgitation because that tubular graft is connected directly to the prosthesis. Thrombosis can occur, but it does not always result in obstructive symptoms or a large increase in gradient. The initial presentation may be stroke. Embolic complications may be how valve thrombosis presents. Suspect thrombosis when there's a new onset heart failure or a change in dyspnea. Suspect thrombosis when there's thromboembolic events or when there's a change in exam. I have one patient that their spouse brought them in and they said, he sounds different. And sure enough, she had picked up while they were snuggling on a change in his prosthesis auscultation. So pay attention to your examination. If you suspect thrombosis, get an echocardiogram. Here are some things to look for. If that confirms or furthers your suspicion for thrombosis, if it's in the mitral position, then move on to TEE or multi-detector CT, whereas in the aortic position, you might go to fluoroscopy or CT. And really, those help you to further characterize leaflet motion. What do I mean by further characterize leaflet motion? Well, let's take a look. Here's fluoroscopy, and one of these two prosthesis leaflets is fixed. We can see the echocorrelate here in a mitral position where one leaflet is fixed and one is moving, and this has resulted in a mitral gradient of 11 very high gradient for this patient. Here we see 3D transesophageal echocardiogram. So in this picture, we are standing in the left atrium looking on FOSS at the valve. We can see that one of the two prosthesis leaflets is moving. We can then mirror the image along a vertical line here. We're now standing in the left ventricle and we can again see that only one of the two leaflets is moving. How do we treat left-sided mechanical valve thrombosis? We have to choose between surgery or lysis. And I used to try and do a decision-making tree, but the 2020 guidelines have really kind of taken more of a bucket approach to this, where they say, look at all these risk factors. If, person, if you have excellent surgical expertise, if they have low operative risk, if they have lytic contraindications, if they're very symptomatic, if it's a large thrombus, if there's also LA thrombus, if there's other surgical need, then favor surgery. Whereas conversely, you can take the opposite of those things in favor of fibrinolysis. So it's really a summative approach to all of these different factors in deciding which one to do. Know that thrombolytics, while they're effective, they are not without risk, including mortality, and there can be a lot of associated morbidity. Bioprostheses can thrombose just like mechanical prostheses. Here is an explanted bioprosthetic that had thrombus formation in all three leaflets. We are learning a lot more about this as we implant uh, transcatheter valves. 
And we, this is something to keep an eye out for. Don't just think of thrombosis in mechanical prostheses. If you suspect it in a bioprosthesis, again, start with your echo, just like we did for mechanical prostheses. Thereafter, you can move on to TEE or multi-detector CT, and I've outlined what to look for on this slide. How do we treat bio, bioprosthetic thrombosis? Well, if you are class four, NYHA class four, replace the valve or give thrombolysis. If you are class one through three, then give 30 days of warfarin. Interesting, right? 30 days, or even for class three, and then recheck. You might say, give me a break, Geski. Why don't we just go and replace the valve? Class three, this is a problem. Well, let's look at an example. Here's an example of a bioprosthesis with two immobile leaflets. And after 30 days of warfarin, here it is. Wow, right, it works. It's not absolutely free of thrombosis, there's still some here, but look at the improvement. And this person avoided thrombolytics or a repeat surgery. Hemolysis is another complication to think of. You can have an increase in LDH, an increase in bilirubin, a decrease in haptoglobin, schistocytes. You should recognize those to go along with hemolysis. Consider this particularly in perivalvular regurgitation where those red blood cells can get sheared as they're going through that small hole. We've learned a lot about endocarditis. Yes, this can affect prostheses. It affects mechanical and bioprostheses equally. And here I show an example of a bioprosthesis that is rocking, it is dehissed. So if the prosthesis is a rocking, start thinking about Cullen's lecture on endocarditis, okay? Patient prosthesis mismatch can occur. This is where you implant a valve that is too small for the patient. Know that there's not a standard size that fits all. The prosthesis that's appropriate for the boy may not be appropriate for the sumo wrestler. So what we need to do is think about the size that we're putting in and always implant the biggest prosthesis possible. Here are some cutoffs that we can use to describe patient prosthesis mismatch. What are causes of increased gradient across a prosthesis? Well, we've talked about degenerative causes. We've talked about thrombosis. We've talked about patient prosthesis mismatch. You could just have increased flow, say someone who has a high cardiac output or has regurgitation. But there's also this thing called pressure recovery. And anytime someone says those two words together, my eyes start to cross and I start to kind of drift away. I kind of like, what? Okay, there's like, yeah, there's like physics and I don't really know what's going on. And I will say that this can be a very complex uh, thing, and I, I'll give you my basic understanding of what this is, is that sometimes when you have a, a small prosthesis, the Doppler-derived gradient and the cath lab gradient can be discordant. And what we want to think about is that there is a conversion of potential energy in the LV, and as blood accelerates across the prosthesis that is converted to kinetic energy, which is then recovered as potential energy. And a catheter placed here and here will measure the true gradient difference, the true pressure difference. But a Doppler beam that goes through that flow acceleration and the change from kinetic to potential energy may overestimate the gradient because of those physics. I've included one table here just for your review. This is just a nice way to differentiate different causes of increased gradient. I won't read it to you. I think it's more something to have at your leisure. We've talked about a lot of different things. We've talked about types of prostheses. We've gone through different management aspects of prostheses and many different complications. I would like to leave you just with one slide of pearls. Aspirin should be used in all bioprostheses but only in some mechanical prostheses, and that's a change in the guidelines. It's not the default for mechanical prostheses anymore. No DOAX in mechanical prostheses. That's a Mona Lisa frown. They are okay in bioprostheses after that three-month implant window. If you have the alignment, if the stars are aligned, then the INR goal is 2.5. If the stars are not aligned, then the INR goal is three. Fingerprint the valve at the time of implant and then follow clinically with echo every five and 10 years. But don't do an echo just to do an echo at every follow-up. For a surgically implanted bioprosthesis, don't do annual echocardiograms. If you have a patient where the stars do not align, 
then you should consider bridging them when they have procedures that require bridging. And always implant the largest prosthesis possible. Thank you for your time. Fantastic, Jeff. Thank you very much. Well, let's see uh, how we've improved our knowledge of management of prostheses with your questions here. So remember, the first question is this 38-year-old man undergoing AVR with a bicut for bi four bicuspid aortic stenosis. He's got a St. Jude bileaflet valve. His EF is 60, no history of arrhythmia. What is the antithrombotic regimen for this patient? Is it I warfarin to an INR of 2.5, that same warfarin goal plus aspirin 81? Is it warfarin to an INR goal of 1.5 to 2, or a pixaban dosed for renal function? Two thirds got that right. That is an improvement. So you want to emphasize the point here? Yeah, so I think this is falling in line with the 2020 valve guidelines. So this is a young patient that really has no reason to be on aspirin at this time. And in someone like this who is, has an aortic position implant with a bileaflet prosthesis and no other risk factors, our stars are aligned, so his INR goal is 2.5, I don't see a compelling reason to place this person on aspirin which is a change compared to the, the prior guidelines. So I think this is, is emphasizing that point that now the antithrombotic regimen of choice would just be warfarin with an INR goal of 2.5. Are you actively taking your prior mechanical bioprosthetic, uh, mechanical prosthetic patients off of aspirin? Are you, so, when, when they visit you, are you calling them? Are you taking them off? How, how are you handling that? Yeah, it's a great point. I, I didn't uh, do a blanket phone call to all of my mechanical prosthesis patients telling them, stop your aspirin immediately. Um, but what I would say is when I bring them back, I'm individualizing that discussion. I think that the, the wording, which I, I even put in direct quotes, I thought was very thoughtful about how that is because if you have a patient with severe coronary disease or, or multiple other risk factors, you may still choose to keep them on the aspirin. Mm -hmm. The guidelines don't say you can't. But it's a 2B, meaning it's not really something we would encourage as the default. So I, I am dropping aspirin in some patients as they return to me for follow-up visits, but I haven't just called everyone and say, drop the aspirin. Having sat on guidelines committees, I'm sure that they debated each word in that sentence and the order in which those words occur. Um, yeah, that one was very much appreciated. Yep. All right, question number, oh, actually, I want to ask you another question about this, about this one. Yeah. So you stated INR goals both as a single number and another option as a range. Was that on purpose? I, I, how do you approach it clinically? Yeah, I think. Back in the day when I was uh, a young cardiologist, everything was stated in ranges, and now we've gone to these point estimates. So talk uh, about that. Yes, yes. Well, um, I, would, I would say that this is a change that falls in line with guidelines, um, that for all uh, INR goals, they've now been changed to single digit numbers with the exception of this 1.5 to 2, and that's because of actually how the FDA approved this super alignment of aortic position uh, on X, no risk factors. That's approved for an INR goal of 1.5 to 2. And I actually kind of like the INR goal of a single digit. I think it tells us that this is really where we want to be. The, I think a lot of the variability in uh, outcomes and morbidity that goes along with therapeutic anticoagulation is because of the swings when people are too high or too low. And this really tells us this is the number we want to shoot for. And it's still okay to say, you know, within a range of two to three. It's not like that went away, but how we describe it to patients, how we shoot for it, I think with a single number is a little bit easier to digest. Got it. All right. Thank you. The next patient is a 55-year-old with a Medtronic Hall mitral prosthesis uh, who unfortunately had a stroke. At the time of the stroke, the INR was 2.8. The antithrombotic regimen with warfarin with a goal INR of 3, and they were on aspirin. So what do you recommend now? Increasing the aspirin to 325 with no change in the warfarin dosing, add clopidogrel, increase the target INR to 3.5, increase the target INR to 4.0, or change the warfarin to dubigatran? 
Okay, so two-thirds increase it all the way to four, and that's the answer you've said is correct. Want to talk about that? Yeah. So what I would say in this, a lot of times, you know, a niner goal of four, which, again, would have been 3.5 to 4.5, mm -hmm. makes many people skittish, yep. right? But we, we have those older trials that show that the, the risk of bleeding doesn't exponentially increase in that range. And when you have someone who's already on a higher INR goal, so the stars have not aligned, and they're already on aspirin, we really need to ratchet it up a whole point for our INR target. And uh, I think, you know, you might have a patient who has this, who has an INR goal of three, but isn't on aspirin. Mm -hmm. Well, then adding back in the aspirin is the thing to do. That's, that's what I would do to avoid trying to ramp up the INR to four. But this question really stated that we already had a higher INR goal of three, we already were on aspirin, and they still had a, a stroke, so we, we need to definitely ramp it up. I was glad to see that 0.0% of people wanted to give this mechanical prosthesis <laughs> a DOAC. That is a Mona Lisa frown. Excellent. All right. Question number three is an 83-year-old man presenting five years after mitral bioprosthesis and is having class two dyspnea. The mean gradient across this valve is 11 at a heart rate of 64. What is the most appropriate initial treatment? Is it surgery, lytic, eptifibotide, or warfarin? Excellent. Great. Great. So most people said start warfarin, and you demonstrated that case uh, near the end of your talk yeah. specifically. And, and I think uh, even if this was a class three patient, I made them class two in mm -hmm. this, but even NYJ class three would be okay. It's only when we get to NYJ class four where we say, you know, we're really worried about rest symptoms, hemodynamic compromise, where we need to either go to a, uh, to a valve replacement or lytic therapy. Warfarin is, is surprisingly effective at improving bioprosthetic thrombosis. And that's a really excellent point. All right, case number four, 78-year-old woman presenting for an annual physical. It's been three years since she had her aortic valve replaced. She has a 23 millimeter bioprosthesis. She's doing great. She's got a short ejection murmur uh, over the aortic area. No cardiac imaging has been performed since shortly after the operation. So when do we need to image her now? Is it now to determine her gradient? Is it wait three months to do it? Do we wait a year to do it, or we just don't need to do it at all? I'm shooting for that 95%, Steve. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Nope, didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Uh, we're probably saving it for one of those PV loops, the 95%. Probably, yes, exactly. So you're saying no cardiac imaging is required. Uh, talk us through, again, this, the, 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 the point here you're trying to make about follow-up imaging. Yeah, so in a surgically implanted bioprosthesis, the times when you're going to image it are you're going to fingerprint it, either during that hospital stay or shortly thereafter to say what's normal for this person for their valve. Then you're going to re-image it at five and 10 years. The, 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 the case stem here that we provided was someone who was three years post-surgical implant. Uh, they had no symptoms. They had a normal finding examination. You can have a, a small flow murmur that goes along with a bioprosthesis. And as long as we didn't have new symptoms that the patient is describing or a change in physical examination finding, the correct answer here is no imaging. And I think this is a very fair question for a board's examination because we really shouldn't be over imaging these patients. Right now for transcatheter um, aortic valve implantation, we're still doing annual assessments. That's what was done in a lot of the yep. trials. Yep. And I think it will be interesting to see how that evolves. I don't think it will stay that way forever. Yep. I think some of that recommendation really just relates to we don't know what the right interval is yet. So yeah. stay tuned, I guess, for evolution of that timing. Yeah, I, I think that is a really important point, and the, and the guidelines do emphasize this, that you know, historic practice has been to do echoes all the time. And you know, the prostheses just don't deteriorate in those annual steps, as long as you are doing a clinical assessment of the patient 
are you feeling okay? What are you doing? You're listening to the valve. There's no changes there that I think this is a really critical point.